Okay. So, uh, Mr. Stephen Gundry, thank you very much for your time, sir. How are you doing today? I'm good. And you actually got, you know, since I'm a surgeon, you got the Mr. Correct, uh, you know, coming from the UK. So. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. Surgeon. Okay. So since you're a surgeon, it's a mister, it's not doctor. Correct. Um, but over here, I'm a doctor. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I came across your work through, initially through a book of yours, The Plant Paradox. And yeah. I think I first of all heard it on a podcast where somebody was talking about plant poisons. And I was I was thinking plant poisons must be something in the in the wilderness or something that kills birds or whatever. And then as I started to listen further, I was like, what the food that I have in my house right now? I was like, no, this th this doesn't make sense. So I then decided to get your book. Um, and I was like blown away and disturbed at the same time. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. How, okay, so could you just uh, give us um, a, a briefing on the book, The Plant Paradox, first of all, so people understand what it's all about? Sure, the, the Plant Paradox I wrote, um, it's been a few years now that, um, I actually think we ought to eat a lot of plants, but uh, a lot of plants don't have the opinion that we ought to eat them. Uh, one of the hardest things for us to imagine is that plants have a life and that they don't in general want to be eaten and they certainly don't want their babies, their seeds eaten. And you and I could run from a predator or hide from a predator or fight a predator, uh, but a plant doesn't have that ability. But plants so were here first and they're incredible chemists. In fact, they're alchemists. Um, they can turn sunlight into matter and we haven't figured out how to do that yet. So plants use um, a variety of techniques to deter being eaten. And one of the things that I focused on in the plant paradox was these proteins called lectins. And lectins are used by the plant to actually produce microscopic holes in our gut lining that causes inflammation and causes any plant predator to think twice about whether it really wants to eat that plant. And I'll, I'll give you another example. Um, a jalapeno pepper, for instance, um, is one of the plants that really doesn't want us to eat it. And we're the only animal that would actually take a second bite of a jalapeno <laughs> pepper. <laughs> With pleasure too, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <It's, laughs> and, and, you know, in, in, in Jamaica, of course, they're called bird peppers because, you know, birds can't uh, react to that toxic substance. And so birds were designed to carry those seeds away, but but not humans. Well, that's just, an, just one example. Yeah. One of the interesting examples is gluten, uh, which most people know about, is a lectin. And gluten is one of the mischievous lectins. But what's so interesting for most people is that most people who eat gluten-free foods um, inadvertently are eating a diet heavy in lectins, whether it's brown rice, whether it's pea protein, whether it's corn, these are all heavy lectin containing foods. And so many of my patients um, are eating a gluten-free diet and aren't getting any better or still suffering and in the new book, Suffering from Low Energy, and they don't understand until we take these other gluten-free foods away from them that they finally start getting better. Wow. I need to definitely read a bit more into that then because not that this is even a good choice to eat, but I do have like um, on the occasion, I'll have a uh, gluten-free bread um, because I, I like bread. And obviously- oh, I not... love bread. Mm, mm. It does yeah. love me. <laughs> <laughs> and most people. 
and most people, it really doesn't, you know. And so, you know, one of the things I've been trying to do for 20 years now is have people eat food they love, but that loves them back. And yeah. that's the whole deal. Yeah, yeah. So uh, your new book, The Energy Paradox, um, is very interesting. There's loads of great pointers in there. I haven't been through the whole thing yet. It's but a um, weed. Yeah, yeah. And I read quite slow. I'm more of an audio book person. Do you have this on Audible yet? Yeah, actually, uh, I just finished the recording this past week. So it will be on uh, audio, very, Audible very shortly. Okay. Uh, if you could ask your assistant to email me immediately when that's available, then I'm downloading it straight away because I'll get through that in lightning speed. All right. Uh, all right. Yeah. I listen to audio books when I'm cycling and training and that sort of thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like energy is, I think it's, it's such a rare thing now. It's, it's um, especially at, at this day and age where people are spending probably less time outside getting sunlight or grounding. That's if most people know what grounding is. I think there's like a community of people that know about grounding and certain um, biohacks, but um, yeah, energy 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 um even as people get older sometimes they say yeah you know when you get older you get a bit more tired and and the thing is as i've got older i found that i, I feel a bit more energetic but i think that is simply because um my choices of things which i do are a bit more in line with my goals like health goals whereas when i was younger um I was doing a lot of stupid things. <laughs> um, so the plant paradox. Um, if you could just give us a, a brief intro into what it's about, and then we'll just uh, we'll, we'll just go a bit more into the book itself. Uh, you mean the energy paradox, the new one? Yes. Yeah, sorry, the energy yeah. paradox. Yeah. So it's okay. I've got I've got so many. I, I can't keep them straight. No, that's not true. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, the energy paradox, the tagline of the book is what to do when your get up and go has got up and gone. Mm. And one of the things that's fascinating to me, I, um, I've been doing what, what I call restorative medicine for over 20 years now. And it's startling how many people um, complain uh, about fatigue, about tiredness. And we've, we've been convinced that, you know, being tired or being worn out or not, not having our get up and go anymore is normal uh, because of our stressful lifestyle, our stressful environment. And it's normal at two and o'clock in the afternoon to have uh, a double espresso uh, to, you know, power through or to slap down an energy drink to, you know, to power through the rest of the day. And quite frankly, in, in my study of um, long lived people around the world, um, that's absolutely not the case. Uh, I've, I've tried to keep up with hundred year old people in uh, Sicily heading up a mountain herding sheep. And, you know, I'm, almost out of breath with these guys and you know and they're thin and fit and the idea that oh you know i, I need to rest for a little while you know couldn't we take a break uh no we gotta get the sheep you know up the hill and so you you look at these people and you go wow uh what's the difference and one of the things that i think is really fundamentally important that i talk about in the energy paradox is you look at one of the last group of hunter-gatherers in the world, the Hadza tribe in Tanzania. And these guys, um, the men walk eight to 10 miles every day in search of game. The women walk three to five miles gathering things. They're incredibly fit. They're very healthy. They're thin. And so a few years ago, researchers said, hey, um, why don't we compare the energy expenditure of these guys with typical desk workers sitting behind a desk all day? And they, of course, figured, well, you know, these Hansas, they're, 
they're burning up energy. They're, you know, they're using up all these calories and that's why they're so fit and, and thin. Come to find out the average desk worker was using and expending the same amount of energy as these hunter gatherers. And they go, what, how can that be? Well, you know, I've, I've been a researcher all my life. So when we do research and we don't get the result we thought we would, we still make up a reason. And this particular, <laughs> this particular study said, well, we conclude that every human being has the, the same amount of energy that, it, that he's going to spend. And it's conserved across no matter what you do. And when I read that study, I went, wait a minute, come on, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my work is in inflammation. And most people now have heard about inflammation. Most of us agree that chronic inflammation is really underlying all disease processes. And certainly we now know about pre-existing conditions being a setup for COVID-19, for example. But Inflammation takes a huge amount of energy and it's, it's kind of like a fire and fires consume a lot of fuel. And our immune system uh, starts this inflammation. And as I talk about in the energy paradox, most of us uh, living in Western society, unfortunately have what's now called a leaky gut. And we have particles coming across the wall of our gut, like lectins, for instance, and bacteria particles that our immune system sees and literally a war is happening, happening inside of all of us. And that war, that information, inflammation is sucking all of our energy for that war effort. Mm. And there's very little left for the rest of us. So the conclusion of those desk workers was, yeah, they were expending huge amounts of energy but it was energy used in inflammation. And there wasn't any energy yet to do what you wanted to do. And also there wasn't any energy to power your brain. And that's another point of the book. I now see people in their twenties and thirties with brain fog and, you know, they forget things and they go, I, I, I guess this is normal. You know, I'm, I'm a young mother with two kids and I guess, you know, I have mommy brain, it's now called. Mm -hmm. And that's not normal. And it's literally because our, our food and our system, our way of living is, is sapping every last ounce of energy out of it. And the, and the book is a step-by-step -step way to get your energy back. Mm. It's, it's so fascinating that it's, it's now become the norm that, yeah, you expect to feel some kind of fog throughout the day. Like, okay, it's about that time. Let me have a coffee now to try and bring myself back up. I was dipping again. Let me have another one. And, and you know, it's just, it's weird. Like it's even said, okay, if it's a certain time of year, then you're expected to feel down and, and that sort of thing. Um, I, f I find it fascinating. We've, we've now just accepted it as the norm, as opposed to trying to figure out how do we get that back? How do we bring ourselves back to, I don't know, some state of equilibrium um, where, where it should be, then, ah, it's all over now. And 20 year olds, as you say, that's, that's crazy. Um, what would you say is the reason for most people to feel fatigued? Like what would be the main reason well as i as i talk about in the energy paradox uh, one of the one of the big reasons besides the leaky gut that most of us have is that our food has been changed dramatically over eh, the last 40 to 50 years we now eat highly processed ultra processed food and let me just give you an example our ancestors or like the hanses so they eat whole food. So if they eat uh, a tuber, a sweet potato, it, they eat it whole. If they eat um, a gazelle, they eat a, you know, a muscle of a gazelle whole. Um, now we, we don't eat like that. Even if we eat a sweet potato, it's now a, you know, a chip. Mm -hmm. 
And even if we eat protein, a lot of our protein has been so ultra processed into protein hydrolates or amino acids and our energy bars, our energy drinks are now very easily quickly absorbed sugars, proteins, and even fats. And what happens is we have little organelles that take these substances and convert them into our energy currency, which is ATP. And these mitochondria are really good at taking sugar and making ATP, very good at making ATP out of protein and very good out of uh, fat. But what they're not good at is handling these three things all at once. And what's happened in our modern diet is that sugars, proteins, and fats arrive in our mitochondria, bam, all at once. And we literally get rush hour in our mitochondria. And our mitochondria go, what the heck? You know, stop, I, I go back, I can't handle all you guys. And you know, I live in the outskirts of Los Angeles and you know, rush hour in Los Angeles is now kind of 16 hours every day. Wow. And, and seriously. And, and <laughs> anybody know, understands rush hour, there's obviously too many cars, too many trucks, too many buses on the road. And we have all these stoplights on the freeway entrance ramps to try and slow things down, but then those back up. So the same thing now is happening in our mitochondria. And let me give you an example from the book. So let's suppose we eat kind of a, a fast food lunch and two o'clock in the afternoon, like you mentioned, we all, we were, you know, we're falling asleep in our desk and, you know, we need a coffee to pick ourselves up. And some people say, well, that's because you ate inflammatory foods. That's the reason. Well, inflammation doesn't happen that quick. But what happened was your energy factories, your mitochondria just got overloaded with all of these various substances that you absorb from your gut very rapidly. And it, everything, traffic came to a stop. And that's why your energy crashed. And so one of the things I try to do in, in the book is try to limit people's rush hour and to try, among other things, to getting us back to eating the way our great grandparents ate. They ate whole foods, not ground up whole foods. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's difficult to find whole foods these days. It is. Yeah. You you got you have to specifically search. And the thing is, when you go to a place like a supermarket, it's such a I don't know, you guys call it a grocery store, I guess. Um, I don't know, you might call it a supermarket. Yeah. But well, it's well, they're right. Yeah. <laughs> but it's such um it's just it's just a place which just has it's just convenient foods, really. It's yeah. uh, it's everything's just been put there for convenience rather than people's health. Even when you look at certain items, which says like um, high protein and it does make me laugh, you know, um, low sugar, low fat. And I, I'm, you know, I, those things, it's like a warning sign for me. I'm like, okay, I'm going to keep away from that. <laughs> um, yeah, and quite frankly, if you know, if if people are re actually reading a nutrition label and nutrition facts, probably they ought to put it back because there's not a nutrition label on a head of broccoli. Uh, <laughs> there's not a nutrition label on a on a piece of uh, cod. Uh, it just uh, it doesn't exist. So beware of nutrition labels because they've been made to. Um, fool us into thinking there might be something good in, in that food, but in fact, probably not. I'll actually tell you a personal story. Um, when I, uh, we talked off camera, I had the pleasure of spending a year as a senior registrar in children's heart surgery at Great Ormond Street um, in uh, Russell Square. And I was a big fat guy uh, when I came over to uh, London and I, people used to make fun of me, you know, you know I had a big gut. Mm -hmm. And when I, when we moved to London, I lost uh, over 40 pounds. And I'll tell you why that was. Uh, 
when we lived in London in the mid eighties, uh, there, the only fast food that actually existed was Wimpy's. Um, that was, right. that was it. And it was pretty rare, but I mean, we had a greens grocer and we had a fishmonger and we did have a supermarket, but it was about a mile walk from where we lived. And what I found was rather than being in the United States where I could snack 24 hours a day and get fast foods and live on fast foods, even though I was a heart surgeon, when I actually ate real food, because that's really all that was available, uh, I naturally stopped storing fat and began living off my fat. And it mm -hmm. was shocking uh, how easy it was. I didn't even try. And interestingly, I stayed like that for about three, three years when I came back to the United States. And then over a period of oh, 10 years, I went right back up to my big old fat self. And it wasn't until I met a guy who I call Big Ed in the Plant Paradox, who changed my life 22 years ago by actually pointing out, I guess, my errors. And I lost 70 pounds in a year and a half uh, just by changing what I ate. But the, the experience in, in the UK was I should have listened, you know, I should have realized back then what, you know, what the difference was, but I wasn't smart enough, I guess. Mm -hmm. it, it happens. Well, it's, it's quite interesting when you eat healthy, naturally, you continue to make other healthy choices as well. Everything just falls into place. You get, I don't know, you have healthy relationships with people. You speak in a more healthier tone, you know, you see. You know, I'm, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things that I talk about in the energy paradox is we've neglected the other organ within us, which is our microbiome, this collection of hundreds of trillions of bacteria that live in our gut. And we now know that this collection of organisms actually determines our energy levels, but like you brought up, it actually determines our mood. It actually de determines whether we're gonna have a good outlook on life or a bad outlook on life. And it even determines our food choices. And we now know that we can take, uh, so I, there's two kind of bugs in your gut. There's your gut buddies, the good guys, and then there's the gang members who have no interest in you whatsoever, but are only out for themselves. And the gang members love simple sugars and they love fats. And we now know that they actually send text messages to your brain that says, hey, give me some sugar, give me some fat, you know, or somebody's gonna get in trouble. <laughs> and, and if you starve those guys and give it about three days and feed the gut buddies what they like, which is lots of greens, lots of tubers, believe it or not, lots of olive oil, they in turn, will start sending text messages to your brain saying, that's what we need. Give me more of this. And I have, I have meat and potato guys that, you know, I try to get over to salads and things like this. And they go, there's no way I'm going to do that. Uh -huh. They come back a month later and said, you're not going to believe what's happened to me. If I don't get a salad every day, I'm ready to kill somebody for a salad. And that's not me. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, it's become them because their gut buddies have taken over their life and for the good, I might say. And so a lot of the book is, OK, let's eat for them uh, rather than for the gang members. Yeah, that's that's so a couple of things come to my head right then was I found my I do love salads. And the moment I have it one day, I'll be like, ooh. Can I have it the next day? Do you know what? I'm going to have it again. And I'll have it again and again. It's so easy to make and it's so delicious. You can throw so many different things in the salad. It feels refreshing and filling. And yeah, it's so great. And then on the other end, if you decide you're going to have a day where you're like, mm, do you know what? I'm going to take my foot off the gas and um, I'm going to go to the dark side a little bit something looks really nice and it's really tickled my fancy. And 
I don't know, you, you divulge, you, you have a bit of, I don't know, pizza or something. Tastes great. You have this sudden rush of, I don't know, endorphins and all types of chemicals flowing around. But you also have, it just, just a subtle taste for other stuff, which are a bit sinful. And it's quite interesting. You kind of think, hmm, do you know what? I wouldn't mind some ice cream right now, or maybe some cookies. Yeah, I might as well, you know, I mean, it's my day off. But it's, it's, there's more to it than that. You think that it's just a coincidence, you kind of think, but I think there's a lot more going on there. Like when you're talking about the, uh, you know, the gut buddies and the, uh, who's the other dudes? <laughs> the gang members. The gang members, you know, the gang mem members, you know, they're hugging you like, look, man, we're together on this. It's all good. It's your day off. And then you have the cookies or the ice cream. And then they're like, look, man, it's look, let's not stop it here. We might as well go all out. You know what I mean? Start reeling you in. And before you know it, it's kind of creeped in on the next day. You know, yep. you get little reminders throughout the day. Like it was so good yesterday. That was you remember? Good. Yeah, yeah. Let's do it again. No. Yeah, and that's actually what happens. You can actually show um, in three days that you can you know, change your gut bacteria over to a friendly group. But with each successive day where you give the gang members what they want, they rapidly retake over. And it's yeah it's 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 not in our head it's actually coming from our gut and for years i really kind of resisted the idea that these little one cell organisms could you know oh, take you know take over you know my really smart brain <laughs> but in, in fact uh, it's been shown over and over and over again I, i'll give you a great example uh, from the uk there was a woman who was a great marathoner, I won't mention her name, but she was written up in all the journals. She um, developed a horrible uh, infection in her gut, uh, which some people now know as C. difficile, which literally could kill you. And it's very hard to treat. And uh, the treatment now is a fecal transplant, uh, giving somebody's poop from somebody else and shoving it up your rear end with an enema. And right. it actually, cures uh, C. difficile. Well, we try to get someone who's a close relative because believe it or not, relatives share a lot of common bacteria. Mm. And so she had a, a niece who was about 30 pounds overweight, but otherwise uh, a good match. So she got her niece's fecal transplant. Wow. And she recovered. And over the next year, despite going back to marathoning she gained 30 pounds and so she became you know occupied by a whole different set of bacteria that were actually really good at telling her what to eat and also we now know were really good at extracting more calories out of the food she ate and passing them on to her so and this has been duplicated in animal studies. Believe it or not, we can take skinny rats and give them fat people's poop to eat. Rats love to eat poop. <laughs> and they'll become fat just because they have a new set of bacteria that take over their eating habits. And, you know, it's like, it's like Star Wars. It's like, doo, 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 doo. I mean, how can <laughs> Yeah, that is really, really, really interesting. And I think it's really good to really take self inventory when you're eating food. Um, just being aware, just being aware of how you feel. Yeah, you might feel happy if you eat, I call them sin foods. Everyone's got different names like cheat meals and stuff. Yeah. Like you, you might feel happy, but just, just question everything else, you know? Um, I remember one time, just like what I was saying earlier about, you know, you know, let me just take the edge off, you know, I eat clean all the rest of the time. I was in the town and I decided to get myself a sausage roll. I went into a place called Greg's where they serve bakeries and pizza and that sort of thing. And I got a sausage roll and I think I got a, a chicken and mushroom pie as well. I ate that. I was fasting as well. 
And I think I broke my fast about three o'clock in the afternoon. So I was like, oh, looking forward to it. Ate it. And um, when I finished it, I was like, mm, like, you know, sucking my fingers off. And I was like, <laughs> man, that was so nice. I don't know whether it was because I haven't had anything like that for a while or because I broke my fast. But in any case, I'm going to go back and get some more. Went back, ordered some more. And then I, I went into a shop because I needed to repair my phone. Went to the shop and gave it in and then they returned it back. And then I went home, went to switch on my phone and it didn't switch on. Now it was working before. I just wanted something changed on the phone. And it just stopped working. I was like, what's this all about? And I just had a completely change of character. I have no idea what, what, what went over me, but I called up the store and I was fuming. I was fuming. I was effing and blinding. It was like, it was totally out of character. I'm never like that. You know, I, I'll think logically, okay, they've obviously done something wrong. I need to try and get this rectified as soon as possible. But I took it upon myself to believe that it was some vindictive purpose. <laughs> it was an evil plot. I called the guy up and I was like, why did you break my phone? Like, and just like as if he'd done it purposely. And I was like, it needs to be dealt with immediately. He was like, the technician is not back until next week. And I wouldn't accept it. And I was swearing and I don't even swear that often. And it's not until the, the conversation was done, my heart was racing. And I was like, I don't get it. Why am I feeling this way? I'm, 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 I'm enraged. Why am I feeling this way? And then as I, as, as I started to calm down, you know, parasympathetic started to kick in. I was like, wow, really? Because of the food that I know. It I can't like, be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please, yeah. Please tell me it's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. It, 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 it really, it was almost like it was a thank you moment, like a blessing, like, okay, thank you. That was like a, it was a massive highlight to me. It was almost like the universe was trying to tell me, look, don't eat this crap. And it was, it was such a loud awakening for me. I was like, okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, when I went to the shop to hand my phone in and then they fix it, the guy was so apologetic, but I was more apologetic. I was like, no, sorry. I'm really sorry. You know, that was not me. <laughs> I was both apologizing and I was like, it's all good, but it's, um, it's powerful. Food is powerful in different ways. It can really energize you or it can really change your character totally. It can enrage you and just turn you into a different person. And people, I remember dealing with a client who was suffering from um, depression for years. And he was telling me he was on medication um, for like, nine years. And um, I started to talk to him just to learn about just his lifestyle. And I, one of the things which just uh, stood out to me was his eating habits. I mean, there were so many bad things which he was doing. Like he was going to bed like really late. Yeah. He, was there, he had lots of blue light for like throughout oh, the yeah. entire day. And he yep. was snacking during the night while whilst on his laptop. And he was snacking on terrible food. And he'd been doing that for years. And I was like, wow, the doctor didn't need to put you on antidepressants. Just look into the food that you're eating. You know, that that is some of it. And that probably would have made a, a big change to your life, you know? And I think, um, yeah. So yeah, and I and I talk about taking blue light away from people, and you know, getting blue blocking glasses on at nighttime. Um, yeah, it's all actually there in the book, and all of these things. We're now beginning to realize, and I, I talk about it in the book that anxiety and depression is is not in your head. It's actually you know coming from these habits and these mistakes. And Dr. Daniel Amen, one of our preeminent uh, psychiatrists, now says that probably most mental illness is actually from gut dysbiosis and leaky gut and these hormones and chemicals that these gang members are making. And if you had good guys, they'd be making good chemicals for you. 
And I see that so many times in my practice and I write about it in the energy paradox. You can, you can get people off of these antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications. I'll tell you one other interesting story that really impressed me years ago. There's a, a little Midwestern town in the United States in Appleton, Wisconsin, and it's a college town. And they decided to, in middle school, uh, equivalent is, is junior high school, um, ninth through uh, 12th grade, no, sorry, seventh through ninth grade. Mm -hmm. And they decided to have an organic little cafe, uh, bring breakfast and lunch to the kids. And then they taught the parents, we'd like to, to kind of duplicate this at night. And they tracked their truancy, they tracked how many kids had to be disciplined and test scores. And lo and behold, after a few months of doing this, the kids weren't truant, nobody went to the principal's office anymore, uh, and their test scores went way up. And they got really excited. So, oh my gosh, you know, look at this. It's just the, the, the food that's, that's made the difference. So they decided, well, uh, we got to institutionalize this and we're going to hire a company, a big American company that does food service, like, like you see in airports. And we're going to have them do this. Well, no sooner did they hire a big, famous American company that I won't mention. Okay. Every, everything fell apart. Um, test scores went down, behavior went bad, and it was the, they changed the food. And oh. it's it's just like holy cow, you know. No wonder our kids are misbehaving. People are you know shooting each other, yelling at each other. Uh, you look what happens here in the United States all the time now. Yeah. And it's, it's our dumb food. Oh. And, and our, you know, we're on our devices all the time. The blue light is just, you know, driving us crazy. And it's all in the book. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's said that, um, uh, who is it? There was a guy, I think it's uh, David Sinclair. Yeah, he's a friend of mine. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well, he doesn't know me, but tell him I said hello. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. We actually ch we chat quite a bit. Oh, that's awesome. I would love to have him on the podcast as well. Like if, you know, he has time. But I think he mentioned that one of the because obviously he specializes in um, like longevity. Longevity. Yep. Yeah. So um, he mentioned in his book, uh, one of the reasons why we die is because uh, of a series of uh, inflammations um and it's it's just something there's so many different forms of inflammations which we have and yeah that's that i think that's the only real logical reason as to why we die otherwise we probably wouldn't but um i think you you mentioned inflammation steals your energy yep um, that's also interesting could you could you explain how it steals your energy. Yeah, let me uh, let me give you an example. I think uh, probably before COVID nineteen, people could relate to. Um, almost everyone has caught the flu, um, and everybody remembers. You know, you just you feel awful. You feel achy. It hurts to move and. The last thing you want to do is think uh, you just want to binge watch some show and Downing Abbey or something on TV and just, you know, your brain doesn't want to work. Well, people used to think that it was the flu virus that was causing this, but the virus is just a little dumb piece of protein and it has no ability to do that. But our immune system uh, is, if you will, our army uh, that is designed to protect us from invaders like the flu virus. And the immune system sees this protein. It says, oh, that's a bad guy. We don't like this guy. We need to mobilize all of our forces. We need to get all the food and supplies for our army to do battle. And to do that, we got to do two things. We got to make sure that the muscles aren't using fuel and we got to make sure that the brain isn't using fuel because they're the two big energy gluttons. So how do we do that? We make the muscles hurt because if it hurts, you won't move. And we make the brain not work because it, if it's not working, it's not going to consume fuel. 
So it's actually our immune system that causes all those things we associate with the flu to protect us for this battle that has to be done. And so it's the same thing that's happening now kind of chronically every day that we have this chronic smoldering inflammation that 80% of our immune system, all of our white blood cells line our gut because that's where mischief in general can come through. And so we're unaware of this, but I see it in all of my laboratory work and I can spot when this is happening. And the exciting thing is, as we talk about in the book, is that when we teach people how to eat, the timing of their eating, what they eat and all sorts of other tricks like avoiding antibiotics at all costs, unless you really need them, mm. then all this inflammation goes away and we can measure it. And then people will walk in and say, wow, you know, I don't know what's happened to me. I, I can't remember feeling, you know, like this in a long time. What the heck is going on? I feel great. I've forgotten what feeling normal feels like. And we can show them on their labs that all these markers of inflammation that were sky high, like there was a fire inside of them, is now gone. And it's like, you know, they go, whoa. Uh, I mean, we, we have a measurement called C-reactive protein that's abbreviated CRP. And I tell people it's crap. And when your CRP is elevated, you feel like crap. And it's just really great fun to watch people their crap disappears and they no longer feel like crap uh, and that's the whole idea of the energy paradox most people unbeknownst to them have a pretty impressive level of crap going on in their body and mm. it's time to get the crap away that's it that's it you was talking earlier about uh mitochondria um yeah. what would typically be a cause of, let's say, uh, a mitochondrial uh, malfunction? So there, there's a number of reasons. Some of them are innocent drugs that people take. For instance, let's go, let's say you decide to have a, a pizza or a really spicy curry, um, maybe you go all out for some vindaloo ooh. and uh, ooh, uh, <laughs> best best curry in the world is in london by the way and i'll uh, i'll i'll fight anyone who disagrees uh, <laughs> so uh, and you get you know you get this horrible heartburn and you go oh you know i shouldn't have done that and so you take a uh, proton pump inhibitor we call them prilosec or nexium over in the united states or protonics but these guys actually uh, reduce stomach acid and we thought they were quite miraculous but unbeknownst to really anybody until recently we make energy, our mitochondria make energy uh, by pumping protons and electrons. And that's how we actually make ATP, the energy currency. And the proton pumps in mitochondria are paralyzed by these antacid drugs that are now over the counter. And unbeknownst to anybody uh, in the United States, you're only allowed to take these for two weeks because they're so dangerous, but people take them for years. Right. And so it stops the proton pumps in your mitochondria. And so your heart gets weak, your brain uses these, and your brain gets stupid. And so that's just one little example of how, I mean, it's the second largest over-the-counter medication in the United States are these proton pump inhibitors. Over-the-counter. Over the counter, they're totally legal. Right. And we wonder why you know, our mitochondria don't work. Now, the other reason that's happened, both uh, in most Western countries, is that 80% of people, whether they know it or not, are what's called insulin resistant or pre-diabetic or even diabetic. And their mitochondria are actually prevented from making energy properly because of this insulin resistant preventing 
sugars and proteins from properly getting into the, the factory line to make energy. And I go into, that's why actually so many diets fail, like a keto diet or a paleo diet or an intermittent fasting diet is because people's mitochondria are so damaged that they really can't make the switch to where they need to be. Mm. And the book, The Energy Paradox, is a, is a six-week plan to take people by the hand and go step by step to get their mitochondria back to where they can work. It's like, it's like taking on a training regimen. I mean, Mm-hmm. Believe it or not, you could probably hand me, you know, uh, 400 pounds to bench press and I'd you know, choke myself right now. <laughs> but if I had your guidance and you worked with me slowly, I have no doubt that you'd get me back, you know, bench pressing 400 pounds. Uh, I have no doubt, but I couldn't do it the first day. And so many people don't realize that you have to train your mitochondria just like you have to train a muscle and it has to be a stepwise process. And that's the training program in the energy paradox. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, that's good to know, you know, even when it's damaged, you said that like, if you're, if your uh, mitochondria stop working, you die, right? Like that's, that's right. It. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. <laughs> and uh... <laughs> <laughs> you're done. <laughs> and, you know, since you brought that up, we're now convinced that almost all dementia, whether it's Alzheimer's, whether it's Parkinson's, whether it's ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, whether it's simple memory loss, is all because the mitochondria dysfunction and they die. And as they die, your nerve cells die. So, and just look around, we have you know, a crisis in, in dementia. Um, and it's, it's, it's an energy problem in the brain. And I have a whole chapter. If you got brain fog, this may be the best early warning sign you ever had that there is big trouble up here and it's fixable and you got to fix it before it's reached a point where too many brain cells have died. Mm, mm. Wow. 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 Um, that's that's a lot to take in. Um, what um, what's your thoughts on people who um, have fatigue and um, like who are very fatigued and the relation to their resilience to COVID nineteen? Would you say that they are more you know susceptible to contracting? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah, there's, um, and I've written editorials about this in the States. Um, We know that people with pre-existing conditions are obviously more susceptible to to COVID-19. And among those pre-existing conditions are fatigue or chronic fatigue. And we're beginning to find more and more now that uh, COVID-19 susceptibility is because of leaky gut, number one, because your immune system is distracted. And number two, it actually turns out that the types of bugs in your gut, whether you got gut buddies or gang members, makes you much more susceptible to contracting COVID-19. And so we can actually arm ourselves uh, against contracting this virus by changing, getting rid of our gang members. So fatigue is actually a warning sign that you've got a leaky gut. I'm sorry you do. If you had asked me 15 years ago what I thought about leaky gut, I would have told you it was pseudoscience. But now we have beautiful research and assays that prove that fatigue, if I have somebody who's tired, if I have somebody who has fatigue, and I actually measure the level of leaky gut in them, they always have leaky gut. And the wonderful thing is, if we do this program, we can measure the leaky gut going away, sealing, and we can measure the crap going down and all these other measurements. Uh So tiredness is, is in a way, not something to accept, uh, as uh, just, it, that's what it is. It's our modern lifestyle. I'm supposed to be tired. I'm supposed to have 
four cups of coffee and two energy drinks to get through the day. That's not normal. And if we have that, it's actually a wonderful wake up call that starting today, we can, you know, get rid of our tiredness and we can make ourselves much more protected against the next threat. And there'll be another one after COVID-19. And we have to arm ourselves and we can do that. Mm. I'll give you one last example. Um, Most people don't know that 95% of humans are born with an antibody and everybody now knows about antibodies, vaccines, to the peanut lectin. And 95% of us are allergic, if you will, to the peanut lectin. Now, when I was growing up, nobody had a peanut allergy. Um, Nobody. Uh, Everybody was eating peanuts. You could open a package of peanuts in school and they were handed out on airplanes and nobody died. Nobody carried EpiPens to school in case some little kid had a peanut. Mm. Uh, Now, of course, we have this epidemic of peanut allergies. Well, we've always had this antibody to peanuts. What's different? In the good old days, our immune systems were not on hyper alert. Our immune systems were actually taught by our gut microbiome that, hey, everything's good down here. Nobody's coming across the border. You don't have to get your panties in a wad. Just relax, you know, have have a donut and a cigarette and just relax. (laughs) Now, our immune system is always on hyper alert and it's always looking for anything that looks a little bit troublesome. So when it sees now a, a peanut antigen, it goes, oh my gosh, you know, I, I, that's a horrible thing and I've got to attack it. And it's the same thing with COVID-19. People talk about the cytokine, cytokine storm mm-hmm. and it's, you know, it's going after this virus with, you know, guns a blazing. Whereas the people who are asymptomatic, their immune system is calmed by a normal gut microbiome. Their immune system, the microbiome says, hey, 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 you know, that's it. don't get so excited about this. It's okay, we got your back on this. And, and that's what's so amazing. So you look at the pre-existing conditions like high blood pressure, like diabetes, like heart disease, like uh, allergies, like asthma. They're all examples of actually leaky gut. And I'll leave you with this. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, 2,500 years ago, said all disease begins in the gut. I mean, he knew this 2,500 years ago. And I'll I'll, I'll get out of the way. I have have a painting in my office. the road to health is paved with good intestines. <laughs> I, I think I'll put that in tomorrow's uh, social media post. <laughs> I like that. Right. I like that. Uh, look, it's it's been it's been amazing. Thank you very much for your time. I truly appreciate it. Um, I could probably ask you a lot more questions. In all fairness but it's only just that I have a, another podcast coming up soon. Um, but oh my gosh, this, this is incredible. This is incredible. Where can people um, get your book? Is it available on Amazon? Yeah, it's available on Amazon or wherever your booksellers are. Um, my books are very popular in the UK. Um, it, yeah. The Plant Paradox has been translated into 36 uh, languages. So, uh, And, you know, you can go... Uh, I have the Dr. Gundry podcast, wherever you get your podcasts, and uh, you can go to drgundry.com. You can go to gundrymd.com. Um, hopefully, you'll see me on social media, on Instagram. and uh, Yeah, sometime. yeah. I'll, I'll definitely put your details in the show notes. I'll, I'll follow you on Instagram anyway. Um, okay. Yeah, absolutely. The stuff you post is amazing. Um, what else is going to say? Uh, what is your website again? Uh, drgundry.com. Uh, okay. D-R-Gundry, G-U-N-D-R-Y, Gundry. Which, by, by the way, Gundry is an English name. Um, right. Yeah, Cornwall, England, 1626. So, 
Oh, right. You know, the year and everything. <laughs> and if anybody needs any kind of, um, I don't know, like gut health um, uh, advice, they can come to you for that, I'd assume. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, about 70% of my practice now is autoimmune and gut health that people actually from around the world who haven't gotten any results uh, end up in my office and we'll always make room for one more. I actually see patients six days a week, including the weekends. And I'm at my supplement company, Gundry MD on Friday. So I work seven days a week. Right. So, and I, you know, I'm now 70 years old. And so um, wow. fatigue is not your fate. And if I, at 70 years old, can work seven days a week, uh, you can too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. I like that. And you look good for it. You look radiant. You know, you look radiant. I'm full, I'm full of energy. And people go, my gosh, you know, look at, let me see your skin. You're not a 70-year-old guy. You're not a, you know, old fart just waiting for, <laughs> waiting for the rocking chair. You know, I'm the guy who wants to chase these 100-year-old folks up the, up the slopes in Sicily. That's it. That's it. And I, I hope to see that, man. I hope to see that. And later on in years, I want to be nice and radiant like yourself. That's for All sure. right. All right. Absolutely. Oh, you look Even, great yourself. Thank you. It was my birthday recently. I'm 42. So I'm um, trying to keep um, it fresh, trying to, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, our office, our saying is 150 is the new 100. So oh, right. yeah. <laughs> I'll bear that in mind. Oh, gosh. Thank you so much for your time, sir. I truly I really, appreciate it. Roger, thanks for having me on and uh, look forward to talking to you in the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. You take right. care, sir. Pleasure. Take care. Goodbye.